Good afternoon. Welcome to this leadership follow-up luncheon. Uh, what a great deal it is. You get wonderful information, great speakers or panels, and a free lunch. I mean, what's not to like about that? Actually, it's free to you. We want to express our appreciation to Finley Publishing Company. Uh, everyone here that's here from Finley Publishing, would you stand and allow us to thank you for sponsoring today's lunch? Uh, would you pray with me? Dear God, we thank you for the privilege of being together for the privilege of participating in leadership roles, for learning what it means to um, serve you in these callings. May we be better people. May our organizations be more effective. We thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Someone said that learning to lead is like learning to play the violin in public. Um, so think about that one for a few moments. It's my privilege to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Dr. Catherine Fell, uh, is the 17th president of the University of Fren Findlay. She came to us in July of 2010. During that time since then, the university has enhanced experiential learning, community service, and intercultural opportunities. Undergraduate and graduate enrollments have increased with significant increase in international enrollment. And fundraising has reached record levels. Uh, so congratulations, good doctor, on the, all of those. Uh, she previously served as vice president uh, for advancement at Centenary College in Louisiana. She began Centenary as in the Department of English as a professor, and during her 14 years as professor, she taught and published in fields of literature, writing, and pedagogy. She also led in the development of an interdisciplinary major in communications, which grew to become one of the college's strongest majors. She's a native of Stamps, Arkansas, the Southern Bell. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in education uh, in English from Southern Arkansas University a Master of Arts in English from Louisiana Technical University and a PhD in English from Texas A&M University College Station. Uh, Dr. Fell and her husband Roger are the parents of six children and I'm here to tell you in my experience with her in these last years, uh, she lives the kinds of things that she will say to you today. Uh, she's a leader, uh, she cares for people, and besides that, a very good friend. Kathy, please. Well, it's my privilege, of course, to be asked to speak to you. I'm, I'm deeply honored and happy to spend some time together talking about a very important subject, certainly on a university campus and a seminary campus, learning and knowing. I didn't realize until I arrived today there was already a book on the subject, so whatever I fail to mention, just pick that book up and you'll be good. <laughs> so I've got backup. But in preparation for today's uh, presentation and conversation, we did ask you for your opinion on learning and knowing, and some of those answers I'd like to share with you. These were a few answers to the first request to name something you once were certain you knew, but discovered later you did not really know. Just a few examples of your answers. Lightning never strikes twice in the same place. Actually, with each strike, there are multiple hits. Some places are hit regularly and sometimes multiple times in the same store. And that is very disappointing news, but... <laughs> But I'm glad to know it, and I'm glad you learned it by experience and not I. I was once certain that I understood why people behave the way they do. Have you ever thought that? Maybe when you were three? I, do, I, I have discovered that I really don't know. Human behavior is far too unpredictable. I always thought that Paul was one of the original 12 apostles and was shocked to discover that he had not been one. I knew I was invincible, except later I found out I am not. 
I thought it was essential for leaders to be firm, strong, assertive, demanding, insensitive. I have discovered that kindness is not weakness. Common core math. <laughs> that I had all the answers. And finally, numerous limiting beliefs that cause self-sabotage via my subconscious mind. Also from that survey, I found fascinating what some of you are most excited about learning now. Hebrew, how to better live in the present, not to stay stuck in the past, and not to be anxious about the future good lesson. The backstory on the Bible. I never thought of what was happening at the time period of Jesus other than what was in the New Testament. I just began a PhD study in the field of missiology. God's will for me. I am most excited to learn about people, how they got to where they are, and their goals for the future. Also learning about different cultures and countries excites me. Getting people healed and set free of soul wounds of trauma and mental illness. I am most excited about learning to achieve organizational excellence through the growth and personal success of each individual team member. Stocks and vines. Skills to help in working with people. What my highest capacity could be. Our daughter has been at, we have only one daughter, um, and she's been asking me recently a number of questions about the roles of husband and wife, which indicates to me, though I dare not say it too firmly, that we may be looking at a wedding. But don't tell her I said that. <laughs> Having been married for 35 years, I want to say to her, I could have answered your questions far more quickly 36 years ago because I, like many of you, are still, I am still learning. For those of us, <clears throat> excuse me, for those of us who have come to the Christian faith, the beginning of learning the most profound lessons is simply to acknowledge that God is God and we are not. And I believe it's a lesson we keep learning over and over and over again. As Proverbs explains, Proverbs 10, 17 explains, whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life. Consider also Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. These Proverbs make clear why learning beats knowing. That was the lesson the writer and teacher, Holly Ordway, learned far into her accomplished academic career having spent many years accumulating impressive credentials and higher and higher levels of knowledge. If she were here today, she might say that her glimpse into the magnificence and mystery of God was the beginning of real learning for her. In her book, Not God's Type, an atheist academic lays down her arms Ordway discusses her conversion to belief in Christ as the truth, the way, and the light. I think she might agree that that was a soul-deep conversion from knowing to learning, from hubris to humility. And I consider it a great day any time an academic admits she does not know something. An English professor, Ordway discusses her new understanding of a poem written by the Christian writer Jared Manley Hopkins, a poem she had often read. Lines before the verse you see on the screen include these from that poem. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. Generations have tried, have tried, have tried. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge and shares man's smell, the soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. 
There lives the dearest, freshness, deep down things, and though the last lights off the black west went, oh, morning at the brown brink eastward springs, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with ah, bright wings. Ordway finds in Hopkins a Christian who, in her words, offered a vision of the world that made sense even when life seemed arbitrary and confusing. Hopkins' world was to her integrated. It held pain, doubt, depression, and fear, but also joy and beauty. She was not looking for a Hallmark card Christianity. She wanted a real Christianity. She wanted a real God, and she found him. Ordway says this about Hopkins. His trust is deeper than his confidence. Perhaps Ordway means that Hopkins' confidence that his circumstances would improve might have been shaken, and for good reason. Maybe they weren't going to improve. But his trust in God was beyond physical circumstances. Perhaps Ordway means that Hopkins' faith in God was his acknowledgement that God's power and plan are beyond our own capacity to understand and shape our circumstances for ourselves, no matter how smart and talented we may be. All people, including people of faith, from time to time make the mistake of believing that we know more than we do, of having too much confidence in ourselves and our own conclusions about the world around us. Perhaps the reason there is far too much strife between people of different faiths and even among people of Christian faith is that we resist learning what might contradict what we think we know about ourselves, about others, and about God. Krista Tippett, host of NPR's weekly program On Being, wrote in her book, Speaking of Faith, Why Religion Matters and How to Talk About It, what you see before you, an excerpt from that book. It is possible to be a believer and a listener at the same time, to be both fervent and searching, to honor the truth of one's own convictions and the mystery of the convictions of others. The context of most religious virtue is relationship, practical love in families and communities, and care for the suffering and the stranger beyond the bounds of one's own identity. At the University of Finley, one of our founding principles is that we are grounded in Christian faith and welcome all people. Another is that we will engage in civil and respectful discourse with people who do not, among people who do not agree. It's easy to say, harder to do. But pray for us as we try to live out the proof of what Tippett is saying here, that you can be true to your own convictions and respectful of and learn from those who who differ. What do you think the, let's go back, I'm not ready for Covey yet. What do you think um, Tippett means when she says the context of most religious virtue is relationship. Do you agree with that? Do you agree that your faith is lived out in context of relationship primarily? Do you agree, disagree? Does it make sense to you? What do you think? Yes? Yeah, you agree? And think about the relationships. You don't, you don't have to share this with the entire group in, unless you feel moved to do so. But think about the relationships in which you find the most difficulty living out your faith. It's not really the relationship with the stranger. It's the relationship with the people closest to you, most intimate with you, most irritating to you, and to whom you are the most irritating. That is where we're called. Uh, to live out our faith. And uh, it is, as one of our uh, former pastors said, a man's home is not his cavalry. It is not his cavalry. It is his, it's not his castle. It's his, it's his cavalry. A man's home is not his castle. It is his cavalry. 
It's the place where he must sacrifice all. And I think we could say that's true of all of us in our personal close relationships, and certainly with those with whom we work daily. So how do we take these theological insights about learning and apply them to our everyday lives, particularly in organizations we are called to lead, whether as CEOs, ministers, managers, small group facilitators, parents? All of us, at one point or another, are called upon to lead. I submit to you that the best leaders are learners what they come to know in their accumulation of years and experience serves only as the touch point of more learning. Those leaders can be trusted because they are honest about what they do not know, but they quickly and adeptly set about the hard work of learning what they need to know. They are the leaders who grow in what Stephen Covey, in his book, The Speed of Trust, describes as the four cores of credibility essential to optimal relationships and productivity in any walk of life. Covey considers trust to be the missing factor in faltering companies, families, not-for-profit organizations, volunteer groups, what he would call the lack of trust or the lack of credibility. He sees all four elements that you see on the screen as essential for an organization built on trust or a relationship built on trust. I believe that a leader who can demonstrate all four of these elements is a leader open to learning, and therefore a leader who can be trusted. If you focus only on what you have already mastered through your innate intelligence, talent, and hard work, then you probably score quite highly on the levels three and four capabilities, and you do get some results but you will never reach your full promise or inspire others to reach theirs if you focus only on capabilities and results. When you interview a, new, a potential new employee, you, you probably don't ask a lot of questions about integrity and intent. You ask a lot of questions about skills and results, as you should. But we need to find a way to test the integrity and intent of the people we are trying to hire, the grit they bring to the job, the uh, loyalty, the trustworthiness. Hard to do, but very important. Integrity and intent require constant reflection and examination, constant learning about yourself in relation to others, and for the believer in relation to God. So my question for you to consider at this point is if you if you found yourself working with someone who had talent, intelligence, and a strong work ethic, but that person was not honest and did not have the best interest of the whole or of others at heart, what would your attitude toward that person be? And you can answer this. You don't have to name the people that you've worked with, the long list of people you've worked with who fit this category. Don't do that. But what would your attitude be toward that person? A person who's capable, very smart, hardworking, gets some good results. What would, but not honest and self-aggrandizing, self-service. What's your attitude toward that person? You could talk. This is a classroom. I ask the questions, you answer them. It's a, tr it's a time-honored tradition going all the way back to Plato, Sophocles. What, do you, what would your attitude be? Distrust. Distrust. Defensive. Looking for a, updating your resume. Of course you would. What else? Avoid. Would you be happy, joyful, creative in your work? <clears throat> Not unless you're a saint. And the saints can leave now. Because I don't have anything to say to you. You'd be very unhappy, very anxious. You would not do your best work. And you'd be looking for another job. And most of you, if not all of you, have worked with someone like that. If not for someone. What you hope is that you're not that person, or if you ever were that person, that you are no longer that person. All right, let me ask you this. If you found yourself working with someone who could be depended on to tell the truth, who did care about others, 
who was self-sacrificial, who worked hard, but who lacked skills and intelligence to do the job at hand. Simply didn't have those. Good person, but didn't have those. What would your attitude be toward that person? You can tell me. Yes. Okay, so, so if, you're, if you're supervising this person, your first job is to try to put that person in a place to succeed and to, and to grow into his or her strengths. Understood. If that's just not possible, there may be other, I mean, the, the truly fair thing to do may be to help that person find such a position somewhere else. But the first line of attack or of support and advocacy is just that, and I completely agree. What if, what if you are not supervising such person, but you're working with those folks or you're reporting to those folks? What, what then? What, what do you do then? What's your attitude then? Pardon? What? Intolerant. You're just frustrated and furious all the time. I don't speak from experience. <laughs> what? What else? What would, your, what would your attitude be towards someone who's a good person and you care about and who clearly cares about you and the company or the organization, the cause, but can't do the job? I mean, if you're talking about a brain surgeon and she can't do brain surgery, that, that's different. That's, that's easy enough. But we're talking about the rest of us in jobs that are less specifically uh, skilled, but skilled nonetheless. What do you do? Frustration. Stress. 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 I'm sorry. I think you would work to see if they actually understand their job. Right. Well, there's one. There's a start, right? Because part of the respo responsibility may be that the, that the, the, the clarity around the job responsibilities has not been forthcoming. That is possible. So you try all of those things because you all are good people. I think you're close to sainthood because, because I could ask this, I, have a, I could ask this in another group and they'd say, fire them, good heavens, get on with it, right? Or tattle on them and get them gone. So no, that's not your first Response, But nonetheless, if the problem is not solved, it does create frustration because as, as Christian people of faith, not only are you called on to be honest and good-hearted, if you're, if you're given a job to do that you accept, you ought to be able to do it. And you ought to keep trying to do it very, very well. As Flannery O'Connor said about the Christian writer, the first job is to write well. And just be and and to keep improving your craft, your skill, and your and improving upon your talent. That is the duty of uh, of called Christians. So you would be frustrated in this situation too. Maybe not quite as frustrated as the skilled person who's dishonest. So which is worse, though, for you? Which would be worse? Think about it. It's not necessarily an easy answer. Which is worse for you? To work with somebody who's really good, but who can't deliver, or to work with someone who can deliver a certain level of results, but who is not a good person. What? Which ones? How many of you vote for dishonest but delivering? That's worse. That's worse. Okay. And the others of you would vote for number two, good person but not capable. Okay, all right. So you're all in, in agreement. Good, that almost never happens. But they're both difficult situations. All right. Good answers. There is no right answer to that one. In my own work, I know that our campus will be stronger and more joyful if I keep the promise I made to the UF community during the interview process for the position I now hold. And that promise was to be collaborative, deliberative, and decisive. I believe it is essential that I remember that with each decision, though, 
the cycle of collaboration, deliberation, and decision begins again. So, so those are good words. I don't think anybody would disagree with any of those three words. But by collaborate, I mean listen and learn. Find out what is best about the organization and reflect back to the organization what is best about it. In our job, all of us who are leaders, our job is to inspire those around us to, come, to fulfill their greatest promise. So listen and learn as you collaborate. Deliberate. This is the lonely part. This may be, the, depending on the decision and the issue, this could be the longest and most difficult part. But in the deliberative stage of any decision, it requires that you think carefully, you consider pros and cons of what you are facing. For me, it means writing through possible answers. It means praying, praying, praying some more, and learning. And then finally, as you reach the decision, as the decision comes to you, you present it, you evaluate it, and you learn from its successes, from its results or lack thereof. And the process begins again. And I believe to build the kind of trustworthiness and trustworthiness within an organization and the credibility that you all desire and know that you need, that if you make decisions and are honest about their results, whether they're good or bad or somewhere in between, a little bit of both, you will gain more input as you move through the cycle again of collaboration, deliberation, and deciding. And that consistent movement and bringing more and more people into your decision-making cycle builds a culture of ownership, of understanding, of trust, a culture where people dare to disagree without being defensive or angry. I'm not arguing that, that uh, we've perfected that at the University of Finley, but, it's alive, but that process is alive and well. And I think it's one of my jobs to be sure that not only am I following this process, but that I'm giving space and encouragement and incentive to other leaders throughout campus to follow this process. Not to, make a, not to start with decision and then pretend to collaborate. You've worked for that person, haven't you? I mean, one of my colleagues from a previous life described a person she had worked for um, and she said, so, you know, uh, our, our supervisor comes in, he's a very charismatic, very um, inspiring in his presentation of self and plan, but really, after you work with him for a little bit, what you discover is he, his, his mantra is, okay, let's build community. I'll be Jesus, right? <laughs> You've worked for that person. That's not, we're not... We remember God is God and we are not. And so collaboration has to be genuine and authentic. If you're in a situation where you have to move quickly, maybe in your, you're in an emergency situation and you have to move quickly through deliberation and decision and you don't have time to collaborate with anybody, if you know your people well and you know your, your context well, the collaboration you've already done will serve you. And they will understand if you had to make a quick and emer an emergent situation, you were in an emergency situation, you had to make a quick decision. But you build credibility and trust by genuinely spending time in each of these, in each of these pieces of the cycle, pieces of the circle, points in the circle. So I would um, conclude with this, and then I'm going to open. Uh, I'm going to give you some time to talk to answer some questions at your tables and report back out. But I would conclude with this, no decision is perfect because God is God and we are not. And each success and each failure we make as individuals and as a community carries with it a lesson. Learning is our hardest work, our greatest calling, and our greatest joy. So let me ask you to 
look at these two questions, and we have some note takers, I think, at each table. If we don't, you can assign someone to report out. But what areas, if any, of your life do you believe would improve if you would lean not on your own understanding? And number two, from your own experience, what advantages have you discovered when you are working with people who are open to learning? Those are your two questions. We'll give you a few minutes to uh, work on those as a small group, and then we'll have reports out. And then I'll give you an opportunity to add some comments publicly and ask questions of me if you like. So go. minutes to, uh, here's the summary, uh, a few highlights from your tabletop conversation. So we'll just, which table wants to begin? Christina, thank you. Answer one and two or one or two, whatever, whatever you prefer. Okay, so our group talked about the first one, well we talked about both of them, but the first one, we said that it helps you be able to open this teamwork um, and able to pull in more resources and when you do that then you're also um, not you know the group has more body because everybody is is good with the decision and moving forward and it takes the stress off of yourself because you're not the sole person making that decision and we you know talked about it obviously in business but um, you know it applies in your in your family too you can be like the head of a household but getting you know having that open discussion so it's not Okay, great. Good points. Not bad for a young UF grad. <laughs> you newly married. All right, what else? Uh, how about this table? Okay. We never even got to number two. I'm not surprised. I'm sorry, what? What just happened in Paris? Oh, yes, okay. What just happened in Paris? All of the most recent uh, things that have happened in our country, mm -hmm. abroad, striking fear, and uh, making us uh, not wanting to do a lot of things, and if we didn't lean on our understanding, prejudice, prejudice comes in, fear, uh, being paralyzed, that's the word I want. Okay. Just being paralyzed, not wanting to leave where we are. And if, if we give that fear over, if we pray and not lean on our own understanding of all of this, that <laughs> it will free us from all the fear and the stress and this paralyzed uh, bubble that we're in. Okay, so thanks. That's, 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 a, that's a good table talk. So, the, in case you didn't hear it, um, what Kay was reporting from her group is that fear, paralysis, um, anxiety, stress would go away if we lean not on our own understanding. And particularly in light of major world events, catastrophes, terror, acts of terrorism, we're in a scary world. And leaning not into your own understanding doesn't mean that bad things won't happen, but you can find purpose and meaning and live well and meaningfully, even in a frightening and dangerous world. Okay. Yes, this table. Yes. We took a more practical approach to number one, but we started naming areas that in our own life that we sometimes try to control, such as parenting, um, our health, our finances, and we take all of that and try to control it instead of trying to understand the greater scope and go beyond our own understanding. And number two, when we talked about the advantages that we have, there's so many more opportunities to be able to learn, and the possibilities are endless when we practice humility as part of being humble instead of having that pride and that control that comes in when we're not open to learning and being open to other people. Very good point. I mean, we could have an entire session on 
what areas of our lives trigger the need to control. I mean, the list would be pretty long. We're faithful when it comes to big, major events, but who's going to wash the dishes tonight? That's a big problem, if, if we're not all in agreement. All right, what else? Who, what other table would like to report? Yes. We hit on the fact that as leaders, um, others look to us to draw on our own understanding. So to kind of let go of that can be difficult. Um, and so we discussed the importance then of seeking God and um, to help us to make better decisions, you know, and then that would just kind of trickle down into our communication in other areas. Um, but for the second question, we talked about um, when people are open to learning how that it creates an atmosphere of cyclical learning. You know, everyone's learning from one another and then the leaders have less stress because they have to be less intentional in their efforts to train and teach. And then it opens more doors to be able to help others and allocate your services to a wider community because other people are, you know, that learning environment just Good point. So, so in essence, uh, what you were saying is that leaders in a position of leadership often can fall into the temptation of believing they are called upon to give answers and they'd better have answers. And it's faster just to give an answer than it is to really collaborate and think about it and, and listen to other possibilities. So it is, it, I, can, I can understand that. Um, people look to you for an answer and you feel that you need to give them one. And that can sometimes be true. And you and there are times when you're asked a question that you should have an answer to, but not all the time. I remember when all those darling children were in our house and I got so used to giving them instructions, very careful instructions. I remember giving Roger a three-step instruction on something very simple and he thought that was odd. You know, he just thought it was odd because I had a couple of boys who couldn't remember what I told them from the time they left the kitchen to get to their bedroom. And I just felt that I had to give them detailed instruction. But you know, as it turns out, you don't have to do that in every situation. And it's really good if you can figure out which ones those are, right? It's always surprising on you know, how, how often people are relieved and what it does to others when you actually met. I don't know. Right. 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 Okay. Thank you. Other tables. Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, number one, we also agreed. We all are parents here that our parenting would improve. Uh, the other, the other things we talked about is that we'd be willing to take more risks, uh, living in the now as opposed to digging into your, your bag of tricks of, of how you already uh, things that you already know, and then that would lead to you know trying new things as well. Which then that carried over into number two. The advantage is that you would also be willing to try new things, that we'd be better listeners, that we'd be better team players, and then the end result is due to collaboration, uh, you end up with a better process, you end up with a better end result. Okay, thank you. Very good report. Other tables that I have, we have, yes, please, please, your turn. Um, for the first one, uh, we said that uh, basically we'd like to stay in our comfort and uh, sometimes God's trying to lead us in another direction and we kind of like hold back to what we're most familiar with when it comes to um, understanding what direction to go in. And on the second one, that people who are more open to learning, they're more open to change. Um, and that um, when you're open to learning, you're more creative and you can grow the business and improve it by teaching you to grow. Okay, very good, thank you, thank you. So everybody could hear that, do you hear that? Okay, great. Other tables that would like to report, yes. Um, on the first one, we basically came down to, there's no area in our life that's not going to improve. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good point. No area in our lives that won't improve. That's right, <clears throat> and, and, and we did hit, uh, name a few, um, avoiding, it helps us to avoid preconceived notions and actually be open to the learning. And um, increases collaboration, improves value, 
and helps with responses, responses to others, um, especially for difficult situations. And then for number two, the basis was, um, again, it opens us up to in learning and collaboration, but that learning collaboration with people who are open um, can put joy and passion into whatever it is that you're doing. Right, right. And it only takes one in the group who is not collaborative and not participatory to, to throw you off. But if you have a culture of collaboration and honest, open uh, listening, then I found that those few, and we all have a few curmudgeons in our midst, those few begin to feel a little marginalized and they don't gain uh, traction with your entire organization. And it takes vigilance to keep your culture healthy and open and vibrant. Um, and someone over here said you can't just stay in your comfort zone, not as, a, as um, a member of a group or as a leader of a group. You, you can't just assume because you just had a great project completed, everything went well, you worked well together, you built relationships, you're a good team. That team won't stay a team if it's ignored. Just as you can't uh, teach your I thought this at one time, if I finally teach all these six kids to tie their shoes, I'm pretty much done. As it turns out, there was more to do. <laughs> so the same with the people with whom we work. Other table reports? I know we're going to run out of time. Anybody else? Ha questions or comments for the good of the whole on any topic we've covered today or didn't cover today? Anything else you want to add or ask? Good? All right, go forth and learn. Thank you.